Alex. That's good. Test, test, test. Hello. We're ready. All right. What do we have? Four classes left? Woohoo. 
All right, so a little bit of a job opportunity up here. If you're interested, let me know. Had to take advantage. All right, so we covered replication last time. Uh, this time we're going to be covering transcription. Uh, and you'll see that there are similarities and differences. Of course, we're going to be making RNA molecules from a DNA template. So many of you have had um, various... Uh, classes that talk about transcription. Hopefully there's something new in today's lecture to keep you engaged. Let's see if this... Why is it not going forward? That is strange. All right. Okay, so we're going to first look at the process of transcription, and then we're going to look in a little bit more detail uh, at various processes used in processing RNA molecules. Many of you have thought about splicing before. We know eukaryotic uh, RNAs are five prime capped and three prime polyadenylated. And we know that many non-coding RNAs are also processed. So you, from one long initial transcript, you cut into smaller uh, pieces. Okay. God, that's going to be annoying. Why is it not advancing? Because it's a new version of PowerPoint. That's right. All right, let's see what we can do to make this easier to advance. Sorry, guys. There we go. That ought to help me. Or not. Oh, oh. All right, sorry. Okay, so. So we have a variety of different RNA molecules. You have so-called coding RNAs or protein coding RNAs, uh, mRNAs. But then there's a variety of uh, non-protein coding RNAs. Uh, many of you are familiar with ribosomes. Uh, actually, the catalytic function of ribosomes is carried out by RNA molecules. Transfer RNAs are also important in translation. Small nuclear RNAs are important uh, in splicing, and we'll see that in some detail today. Um, we're not going to cover in today's lecture a variety of uh, naturally occurring inhibitory RNA molecules, but we'll cover that just briefly, uh, I believe, next Tuesday. So you have small interfering RNAs and micro RNAs. Okay. So we've covered replication. You know, in replication, you're actually copying both strands of DNA. Uh, and transcription, uh, you have to select one of the two strands and only transcribe one of those strands, okay? And so it's important. The process of initiation is how um, the cell decides which strand to transcribe, okay? And so we have a template strand and a non-template strand uh, in transcription. It's going to take some getting used to. So we've uh, talked about DNA polymerases when we talked about replication last time. Uh, and I, we also mentioned that DNA polymerases always require primers. Remember, we had this primase uh, enzyme in replication that laid down an RNA primer that initiated DNA polymerization, uh, whereas in RNA polymerases, which we're going to be talking about today, you do not need a primer. You can uh, initiate uh, synthesis of RNA molecules, so-called de novo, um, just starting from ribonucleotides. Okay, and so uh, both of them require a DNA template. Uh, we're only copying one of the strands uh, in a transcription. Uh, we have a 5' prime to 3' prime polymerase activity, so the directionality is the same. Uh, we're forming the same bonds. The actual chemical catalysis catalyzed by these two uh, different enzymes is the same. We're making a 5' prime to 3' prime phosphodiester bond. Uh, we need nucleoside triphosphates. Here we have ribonucleoside triphosphates instead of deoxyribonucleoside deoxy triphosphates. Now, DNA polymerases, as we mentioned, had that second um, active site. So if the wrong base was incorporated, the DNA polymerase would pause and shift to the, o the other active site uh, where the 3' to 5' prime exonuclease activity would cut out that base. In RNA polymerases, we don't have um, this proofreading capability. Can you understand or can you guess why that might be? Why we wouldn't need uh, a exonuclease activity? I mean, don't we want to make the right protein? Um, does anybody have any ideas about that? Yes.
That's true. Um, there's this wobbling phenomena that we'll talk about, but also um, RNA molecules are turned over, so their lifetime is very short. So in prokaryotic cells, um, minutes to hours, and eukaryotic cells, hours to days. Um, so if we make a mistake, we're only going to make a mistake in synthesis of that one RNA molecule, and that won't be propagated to our progeny. So the, the consequences of mistakes are less severe because of RNA turnover uh, and because we're, we're really using this to translate, not to propagate, propagate information and uh, genetic information. So we just don't need it. So there will be some RNAs that have mistakes, and potentially, you know, so maybe when you express a particular gene, you make hundreds to thousands of RNA molecules, and each of those are uh, translated in parallel, so maybe if one of those thousand has a mistake, the gross majority of the protein produced won't have that mistake, because the majority of the RNA molecules will be of the right sequence. Okay, so that's a good point. Oh, this is taking some time to get used to. So the, the synthesis that occurs is, again, the 5 prime, 3 prime uh, phosphodiester bond formation. So it's important to realize that the first uh, nucleoside triphosphate that's incorporated maintains its triphosphate. Okay, and so we're going to take uh, this uh, position here, uh, the 3 prime position, 3 prime hydroxyl, is going to react with this phosphate. Remember, we're going to lose uh, pyrophosphate, uh, pushing this reaction forward, and we're going to extend the chain uh, from the 5 prime to the 3 prime direction. And so this is de novo, and that word means that uh, you don't need a primer. So the chemistry is exactly the same uh, here. So base pairing directs the incorporation of uh, monomers into the polymer of R RNA, uh, and we have uh, the uh, first the positioning of the uh, ribonucleotide triphosphate, uh, and then the nucleophilic attack of the 3 prime hydroxyl on the 5 prime phosphate, kicking up pyrophosphate, making the new phosphodiester bond. So this is exactly the same, except for we, instead of T's, we'll be incorporating U's uh, in, the, uh, in the growing RNA polymer. Okay. So we have two strands. So in DNA replication, we're copying both strands. Remember, we have that leading and lagging strand uh, uh, synthesis. Um, here, um, we have a so-called non-template or coding strand, and then we have the DNA template strand. So the, the direction of the synthesis of the polymer uh, RNA is uh, directed by the template strand. Okay, and this is anti-parallel base pairing, and we're synthesizing from the 5' prime to the 3' prime direction. The non-template coding stand, we're not base pairing with that, but if you look, we have the exact same bases in there except for the substitution of U in our RNA, RNA molecule for the T's that are in the DNA molecule. Okay, and so it's important to uh, recognize and, and, and learn how to refer to each of these two strands. So. Okay, so this is the beast, the, R, or the RNA uh, polymerase. Uh, and so uh, here we have RNA polymerase bound to our uh, duplex uh, DNA, and we need to unwind it, right? So initially the DNA is all wound up into a helix, and if we want to uh, transcribe this, uh, we need to unwind the helix. And it's actually, um, there is not a, a in prokaryotic uh, uh, RNA polymerases, there is not a associated there, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, there is not an associated uh, ATP hydrolyzing um, helicase. So it's just the action of adding bases here pushes this forward and unwinds uh, the uh, DNA. And so we're going to need topoisomerases both in front and in back of this, uh, repl or this uh, replication uh, or in this uh, transcription bubble. Okay, and so we're gonna, as we push this forward, we're going to tighten this up, make positive supercoils. Topoisomerase can loosen that up. And then as we come back together, we're going to be uh, a bit underwound. We're going to have negative supercoils. And so we want to have just the right amount of supercoils uh, after we uh, uh, transcribe our gene. Okay, and so here is the RNA molecule. There's about eight base pairs, uh, hybrid base pairs, RNA-DNA uh, base pairs within this um, this transcription bubble. And so we have two channels, incoming uh, a ribonucleoside triphosphate 
come in to here. They're added to the three prime end of this RNA polymer. And then the five prime end of the RNA molecule is extruded, sort of like a, a tube of toothpaste, and it's squeezed out of the backside uh, of this uh, polymerase. Okay, and this is extremely fast. So during the elongation phase of RNA polymerization, about 100 nucleoside triphosphates are added per second. So it's about 100 hertz. It's very, very fast. And so as we've talked about uh, with replication, there's a variety of stages. We have initiation, elongation, and termination. And we're going to be comparing and contrasting prokaryotic and eukaryotic uh, transcription. Uh, we're going to start with uh, prokaryotic transcription. And so uh, the initiation of transcription in prokaryotes occur from the promoter. And here's uh, the sequences of the promoter. So our, this, the beginning of the de novo synthesis of the RNA molecule occurs at this plus one position at the start site. Okay? But upstream of that, um, we have a, two different regions, or actually three. And these regions uh, actually interact with the machinery, the transcriptional machinery. Uh, and so we have this sequence, TA, TAAT, not coincidentally, the, the bases that are being chose are going to help us to pull these two strands apart because we need to be able to open up a uh, transcription bubble. And so here we also have another sequence, and then up here we have a so-called up element. So this is called the minus 10 region, right, the minus 35 region, and the up element. And this is a consensus sequence. So this is for actually E. coli. Uh, and different, sig or different um, uh, RNA polymerase subunits bind to different consensus sequences. So we're going to learn about sigma subunits. So sigma subunit is the actual uh, polypeptide that binds to the uh, promoter. And so sigma 70 uh, binds to this particular uh, sequence. Um, so the closer that a given gene's promoter is to the consensus sequence the tighter the binding of the sigma factor. So in prokaryotic uh, transcription, it's all about making very tight binding of the RNA polymerase to uh, the actual DNA. Okay, and so here's a variety of different genes. We're going to be looking at these in detail uh, next Tuesday. And you can see, in general, they're very close in sequence to the consensus sequence, so they make relatively tight binding uh, to the sigma subunit. Okay. Does this make sense so far? You might have had much of this. I apologize. Okay. All right. So this figure is a bit confusing. So this is the initiation and uh, the elongation steps of uh, RNA polymerization uh, in prokaryotes. And the important critical point that you get here is that these two, all of the factors come together in the RNA polymerase before the RNA polymerase lands on the promoter. So the sigma 70 subunit and this catalytic subunit, the alpha 2, beta, beta prime, omega subunit, these two proteins bind together and then and only then can uh, this RNA polymerase holoenzyme bind to those particular consensus sequences in the promoter. And so the uh, binding to the promoter positions the RNA polymerase for optimal um, um, for initiation at the correct location, right? And so here uh, it's a stepwise process. First, the proteins associate. Then they bind to the DNA in a so-called closed complex. Um, so this is before we've melted the two strands or dissociated the base pairing in the two strands of DNA. The orientation of this binding is determined by the promoter. So we can actually transcribe to the right or the left, depending on which strand we're selecting. And the way you select is by looking for those consensus sequences. Only in one direction would you have the consensus sequence. So that helps us to select the proper strand. So we bind initially. The holoenzyme uh, binds to the promoter in a closed complex. We then melt the two strands apart, separating these uh, into a bubble, uh, forming the open complex. And then, and only then, after forming the open complex, can we uh, initiate transcription. Okay, and so once transcription is started, um, we uh, leave the promoter and we jettison uh, the sigma 70 subunit. 
Okay, so now we just have the catalytic subunit, and this jettison action is, is pushed along by competitive binding of a protein called NUSA. So NUSA binds where sigma-70 used to bind, kicking out sigma-70. And the whole name of the game here is don't stutter. If you slow down during transcription, the RNA polymerase will just fall off. So the NUSA factor helps the RNA polymerase to be more processive. Okay? And so we then extend the RNA molecule uh, until we uh, come to the end, and then we release NUSA, our nascent RNA, and we uh, uh, reuse the catalytic subunit. Okay? And so this is a cyclic process. Any questions on that so far? Yes? What's, what's it ah, it's the termination. So there's two different ways that terminate. Um, but the, when those terminations occur, that causes NUSA to fall off and cause the RNA polymerase to fall off the, the DNA. So we'll get to that in a moment. That's a great question. And, uh, so another yep. question real quick. Uh, can you yep. explain again what the consensus sequence is? Ah, this is the critical point. I'm glad you asked. So this is the consensus sequence. So upstream of where we're going to start the RNA synthesis are these three segments of sequence. The consensus sequence, you can think of that as the prototypical sequence that would make the tightest binding to sigma-70. So this is not necessarily a particular gene. It could be a particular gene, but you can see for, here's a, a list of, of actual real-world genes, and each of these, you know, is pretty darn close to that consensus sequence, but it's not necessarily exactly the, uh, the, the same sequence. If it were, it would make the tightest binding possible, okay? And so that's what's helping us to initiate the transcription. Any other questions, Alex? Good. Okay, so moving along. Okay, so we're elongating, so we're adding uh, uh, ribonucleoside triphosphates and extending this chain until we get to the end. But how do you know the end? There's got to be some signal from the DNA that says, stop, we don't need any, I mean, otherwise it just keep going forever. You make massive RNA molecules. And so there's two different um, mechanisms for termination of transcription. These are exclusively prokaryotic. Uh, termination of transcription. You could add that to your slide. So there's so-called rho independent and rho dependent. So rho is a helicase protein, and we're going to first cover the termination mechanism that's independent of this helicase. Okay, and so in rho independent transcription, you're going along fine until you get to a particular sequence uh, in the DNA, this uh, uh, adenosine-rich uh, region. And so when you get to that region, um, that catalyzes two things. So there's two different forces that are causing the end of uh, transcription here. One, the weak base pairing. Remember AU, you only have two hydrogen bonds compared to three. Number two, a secondary structure forms in the nascent RNA molecule. So you have a stem loop structure. And what this, remember I mentioned there's about eight nucleotides of DNA-RNA hybrid uh, duplex within the transcription bubble. What this secondary structure does is helps to pry um, those base pairs apart. So you're exchanging base pairs, RNA, RNA base pairs for the RNA DNA base pairs uh, in this hybrid duplex. It's normally found in the transcription bubble. So for every uh, RNA, RNA base pair that you form in the stimulant loop, you have one less uh, DNA RNA base pair, okay, until you get to a critical amount of base pairing where it's just too unstable to stay together and everything dissociates at that point. So this is referred to as row independent. Again, two requirements, a weak base pairing, uh, AU uh, base pairing, and a stem loop structure that unzippers the RNA DNA hybrid duplex, okay? Does that make sense? That's row independent. Uh, and that's just the sequence of the actual uh, DNA, which is uh, causing that. So we don't have a protein coming in there. 
Now, rho uh, is a helicase, and so another way to terminate transcription is by particular sequences, the so-called rut sequence. So rut sequence uh, um, initiates the binding of the helicase to the RNA molecule, and then, you know, so our transcription is going in this direction. We're synthesizing from the five prime, three prime direction, and this helicase just snakes its way up uh, the uh, RNA molecule until it actually gets to the duplex RNA DNA, and then it unwinds it in an ATP dependent process. Okay, so this is an active unwinding. So there isn't this necessarily a requirement uh, for AU base pairing there, and there isn't a stem loop. Okay, so there's two different ways, and this is prokaryotes only, so E. coli and other similar organisms. Any questions? Okay. So uh, prokaryotic genes are organized differently uh, than eukaryotic genes. So many of you know um, that each promoter leads multiple uh, structural genes. And so here you have one promoter, and each of these genes encodes for synthesis of a different polypeptide. Okay, and so you have gene A, B, and C. So oftentimes in prokaryotes, you have... Um, metabolic pathways, the genes of the enzymes that are catalyzing metabolic pathways are all expressed as a unit. Because generally, you know, if you want a pathway to be active, you're going to need each of the enzymes there. So this is a so-called polycystronic message. So we're making, uh, we initiate uh, transcription, we have a promoter, we have regulatory in general and prokaryotic uh, transcripts, or in DNA, uh, you have repression as the major um, mechanism of regulation here, and so it's the complementarity of the sigma subunit binding to uh, the consensus sequence that provides tight binding, and then you regulate generally by turning off, although there can also be activator sequences, and in general these, these uh, regulatory sequences are either within the promoter or upstream of the promoter. So this is a polycystronic message. So if you're going to have more than one functional gene within your message, you're going to need a way to internally initiate translation. Right? So ribosomes have to land right in front of each of these uh, genes and translate just a single polypeptide. We don't want to make just one long polypeptide. And we'll look at how that works on Thursday. So eukaryotic genes are not arranged in these operons where you have multiple um, functional genes, they're monocystronic. So you have one promoter, uh, and then you have one functional gene. Okay, and so the, and the regulation of eukaryotic genes is much, much more complex than prokaryotic genes. In general, in eukaryotic genes, it's the activation of transcription. The transcriptional machinery binds pretty weakly um, to uh, the promoter, and it's activating sequences that can be way upstream, they can be downstream of the gene, they can be within introns of the gene. Okay, so it's very, very complex for eukaryotic transcription. So I think that's it for prokaryotes. Um, I have a clicker.
All right. I think we're going to continue. Everybody submit their vote. Come on down. All right. So, there's sort of really two possibilities here that are plausible, right? Is it up? Okay. So let's look at the... Yeah, oh, I'm on the wrong computer. <laughs> that doesn't work. All right, so look at, let's look at this. So we initiate transcription, and then promoter is cleared. Three, four. Okay. So it is B. Some of you said A, where you've swapped these two steps. Okay. So we shall move on now. All right. So now we're going to switch gears and think about eukaryotic... Uh, transcription, and of course, things are much more complicated. And so we have not just one RNA polymerase, but more than one. So RNA polymerase 2 is the polymerase that's going to make our messenger RNA, um, which will make proteins eventually. You know, after we make our messenger RNA, those will be made into proteins. But these uh, non-coding RNAs are made by polymerase 1 and polymerase uh, 3. And so ribosomal RNAs are made both by polymerase 1, and here's one ribosomal RNA is made by polymerase 3. Transfer RNAs, uh, transfer RNAs are generally made by polymerase 3. And then we have these uh, small nuclear RNAs. These are important in splicing. Um, but they don't code for proteins, but those are made by RNA polymerase too. So, as you might imagine, things are going to start simple with the prokaryotes and get a lot more complicated. So, as I mentioned, in general, there's weak binding of the transcriptional machinery to um, the eukaryotic promoter. So, just as in the prokaryotic promoter, we need to initiate, initiate de novo RNA synthesis at a very particular spot, uh, at this initiator uh, position. But then we have a, a variety of regulatory sequences in the promoter, so the so-called TATA box, or TATA box, if you're a little bit less corny. Uh, and so that binds to a TATA box binding protein, a TVP. I'm corny, so I get to say that. Um, but in general, there's very low affinity. And so activation of transcription is going to be important here. And so the, we can have regulatory sequences upstream, five prime to the... Uh, the gene. We can have them within the sequence in introns, and we can have regulatory sequences downstream or three prime to the gene. Okay, and so here's the process. In this figure, um, they've updated it this year, and I think they don't, they didn't necessarily make it more simple. There's one important point here, is that in eukaryotic transcription, you assemble the RNA polymerase piece by piece after binding to the DNA. So remember, in prokaryotic transcription, you assemble everything. You take the sigma subunit, the catalytic subunits, bind them together. All at once, they bind uh, to the DNA. Okay, so here, we're starting this off in a very stepwise uh, process. So we have TATA binding protein binds first. And only then, and only then, can each of these additional transcription factors bind. So the nomenclature here, TF, transcription factor 2, meaning that it's associated with RNA polymerase 2, and uh, a variety of letters, uh, and these are the order in which these were biochemically characterized. So the, the lettering itself is just something to remember. So we have TF2B that comes after TETA binding protein uh, binds uh, to the TETA box, and that TF2B helps to recruit RNA polymerase 2. So this is drawn as just one sort of um, squiggly sausage looking thing. But there's actually, I think, about 12 polypeptides within that RNA polymerase itself. There's a, a table coming up in the next slide. So that comes on. And then, and only then, do you recruit TF2E. So TF2E is the link between the RNA polymerase, the, the catalytic part of the RNA polymerase, Pol2, and the helicase that's important in unwinding. So conveniently, uh, TF2H is the helicase, H for helicase. It just um, worked out that way. Okay, so now we, as we assemble these step by step, one piece on the other, we eventually form this pre-initiation uh, complex. 
But then at this point, it's very similar. So uh, initially, the, the DNA is not melted. We have just full duplex DNA. It's called the closed complex. We then open or unwind the DNA, right? And so that occurs uh, with uh, the help of the helicase. And then uh, we uh, cast off uh, some of the promoters or some of the uh, transcriptional machinery, just like we remember we cast off sigma 70 prokaryotic transcription. Here we're casting off a variety of different uh, proteins and uh, leaving ourselves primarily just with the RNA uh, polymerase itself. And then uh, we open the, uh, the duplex, we start the synthesis, uh, we initiate transcription. RNA molecule starts to extrude through the exit hole. Um, but now we have a gauntlet that's set up. And so there's this C-terminal domain, or one of the polypeptides within the R RNA polymerase has a bunch of serines, threonines, and tyrosines. And those become hyperphosphorylated uh, once we've cleared uh, this promoter. Okay, and so there's, I think, a TF2... TF2H, I believe, can phosphorylate these as, long, as well as one of the elongation factor uh, also phosphorylates this tail. And the phosphorylation of that tail in the RNA polymerase itself helps to recruit a gauntlet of post-transcriptional modification machinery. So when we're uh, doing transcription eukaryotes, um, we're in the nucleus. So we need a five prime cap. That machinery is recruited there. Uh, we also need uh, splicing machinery. Um, that's recruited there. And then the, poly -A, the polyadenylation uh, enzymes are also recruited there. And as the RNA is extruded out of the polymerase, it passes immediately by uh, this enzymatic activity. It's an assembly line waiting for the nascent RNA. So RNA is extruded. We elongate. There's a variety of factors involved in uh, elongation. Uh, and then uh, at the end, we terminate. And the process of termination is actually the, the addition of the poly A tail. So the, the enzymes that add the poly A tail are also associated with an endonuclease that cuts uh, the RNA. And that's how we're going to terminate. We'll see that in a moment. Okay, so we have phosphorylation of the C-terminal domain of RNA polymerase II. Um, during elongation, we have phosphodiester bond formation, uh, and then we clear the promoter, leaving at back a bunch of, of these initial proteins that we assembled. Okay, so this is an initiation of eukaryotic transcription. Any questions on that? So it's a little confusing the way they've drawn this. It sort of looks like it's unsure. Uh, so there's TBP binds DNA, then this binds, and then this binds. Okay, we're not pre-assembling. Okay. And there was a question uh, back, maybe you can, I forgot that we had a question. Going back to uh, row-dependent termination, how much ATP is used? That is a fantastic question, and I do not know the answer. So an interesting question, like, for each base pair that's melted, how much ATP needs to be hydrolyzed. And it seemed you could conceive, I could sort of do an in vitro experiment to get at that, but it's not known. It active, it's going to be lots of ATP because it's actually whizzing through uh, the sequence, unwinding things. So the helicase is, you know, unwinding uh, things, especially at the uh, DNA-RNA duplex. So a little bit of a, a side tangent, okay. But a, a wonderful question. So we're going to move on. So we've initiated, and look at all this insane amount of complexity. That PUL2 alone has 12 different polypeptides, 12 different functional genes that assemble uh, to make an RNA polymerase 2. And these are all these transcription factors. Remember, stepwise assembly at the promoter, starting with TETA binding protein, DBP. Okay, and so uh, TF2H uh, uh, has the helicase uh, activity. Uh, and also uh, can phosphorylate that C-terminal domain. And one of these elongation factors that is eventually recruited also phosphorylates the C-terminal domain. Remember that phosphorylation initiates the binding of uh, the gauntlet of activities that are important in post-transcriptional processing of the RNA molecule. So this is a handy-dandy slide for when you're studying to remember all this junk. All right, so we have the, we've looked at RNA polymerases today, uh, DNA polymerases last time, um, but there's other, uh, viruses can do some funky things. So vir uh, some viruses have an RNA genome, 
and some viruses can make copies of that RNA gene. Now I'm using replicases. Other viruses um, can convert their RNA into DNA using reverse transcriptases. And so uh, we saw this, uh, oh, where did we see this? At the end of, oh, what's at the end? Um, brain fart, someone help me out. Where did we see it again? I can ask you. <laughs> and then I'll think of it. Where do we see a reverse transcriptase before? Telomerase. Thank you for reminding me. I am getting old. So there we had the RNA molecule. So that was an RNA nuclear uh, protein, or uh, uh, RNAP. So an RNA-associated protein. And that RNA within the telomerase helped to template the addition of those repeating units at the ends of the linear chromosome. So, but viruses can do this as well. And so uh, here is a retrovirus. For example, uh, HIV, the causative agent of AIDS, uh, is a retrovirus. And so we have an RNA genome in here. Uh, and this RNA genome has a variety of different proteins that are encapsulated in this viral capsid. This thing is then uh, fused with the cellular uh, membrane, releasing um, both the RNA from the virus as well as enzymes that are important. And so one of those enzymes that is released is reverse transcriptase. So the reverse transcriptase takes our single-stranded RNA molecule and converts it into duplex uh, complementary DNA molecule. And that DNA is then integrated within the host genome using integrase enzymes, which are also packaged in this virus. So once we've integrated this uh, viral genome into the host genome, um, we can then transcribe it, translate it, and make new proteins, uh, all the proteins that are necessary for the capsid, as well as uh, our integrase and our transcriptase. And there's also protease, which is important in clipping up the uh, proteins that are uh, made, that are in, used in the synthesis of the capsid. Okay. And so how does this, the, the, the mechanism of action of this reverse transcriptase involves like eight steps. And if I had showed it to you, I'd have to remember it, and you'd have to remember it. So I'm going to give you the highlight reel of what's going on here. But one thing is obvious. We don't want reverse transcription until we're in the host cell. So there has to be some signal from the host cell to initiate this reverse transcription. Okay, so in this uh, virus particle, we're an RNA molecule. Once we're in here, we need a signal from the host cell to start our reverse transcription. And as it turns out, there's a sequence of complementarity to a cellular host transfer RNA within this viral RNA genome. And so the binding of that transfer uh, RNA to this viral genome primes DNA synthesis. Remember, this DNA synthesis is never de novo. It always starts with a primer. So in this case, once we're in the cell, the host cell, we're going to have host tRNAs. And those host tRNAs um, can uh, base pair uh, to uh, this viral RNA. And that initiates the reverse transcription. So you make, first, a RNA DNA uh, hybrid duplex, where you have one molecule of uh, DNA, one molecule of RNA. We then take this double-stranded uh, hybrid molecule and chew away the RNA, leaving a single-stranded DNA molecule. And one other cool thing that this virus does is uh, there's a region of self-complementarity at the uh, three prime end of the DNA. So in general, there isn't much secondary structure in DNA. We, we think of that mostly in the context of RNA. But in this case, we need something to prime second strand synthesis. And so there's a little bit of self-complementarity here. And that primes the polymerization of the second strand. Okay, So we end up with our double-stranded DNA. Um, but there's a lot of like hopping. So we actually, um, the, the tRNA binds at one site, extends, and then hops to the other side and, and does all kinds of fancy stuff that we're not going to have to remember. Okay, So cellular tRNAs initiate, self-complementarity uh, pr uh, primes second strand synthesis. Those are the things that are important to remember.
Okay, any questions? So we haven't covered really uh, replica repli cases at all, um, but we have now just covered reverse transcriptases. Okay, so now up to this point, we've synthesized an RNA, we've terminated prokaryotic transcription. I haven't yet shown you how we terminate eukaryotic transcription, um, but that comes under the heading of post-transcriptional uh, processing of the RNA molecule. So eukaryotic RNA is capped. We put a safety hat on the end of the RNA molecule, 5 prime N. The 3 prime N is polyadenylated. There's a lot of introns. There's actually introns both in bacterial, prokaryotic, as well as eukaryotic genomes. In general, um, the uh, introns in prokaryotic uh, genomes are only within the non-coding RNAs. Okay, so like the ribosomal RNAs, for example. But in eukaryotic RNAs, there's all kinds of introns within um, our uh, protein coding uh, genes, uh, and those need to be spliced out. Okay, and so we're going to look at splicing. There's lots of different mechanisms for that. And then we're going to look at how uh, ribosomal RNA transfer RNAs are uh, processed. What defines a prokaryote is the absence of a nucleus. So in the prokaryote, you have the possibility of co-transcriptional translation. In other words, as you extrude your nascent RNA molecule out of the RNA polymerase, there's nothing to stop the ribosomes from coming in, binding that nascent RNA, and beginning to synthesize a new polypeptide. Because transcription and translation occur in the same compartment in a prokaryote. A eukaryote has a barrier between these two processes. Transcription occurs in the nucleus, whereas translation occurs in the cytosol. So in eukaryotic uh, transcription, we need to protect the RNA molecule. We need to provide signals on the RNA molecule itself when it's time to extrude the RNA from the nucleus into the cytosol. So the actual 5' prime cap, the poly A tail, helps to provide signals to pore structures within the nucleus that allow the RNA to be snaked out. And so transcription and translation cannot occur at the same time. But in prokaryotes, when you can have co-transcriptional translation, you can actually use this co-transcriptional translation as a, just a beautiful um, regulatory mechanism. So we'll see that in what's called the TRIP operon uh, coming up next Tuesday. Okay, so we're going to really focus mostly on eukaryotic uh, uh, post-transcriptional uh, uh, modification of RNA molecules. Okay. And so in eukaryotes, again, you're adding a 5' prime cap. As soon as you've extruded out the 5' prime end, remember, you're synthesizing 5' prime to 3' prime, so the 5' prime end is done first. Put a fork in it, right? So you stick it out there. Um, that 5' prime end passes by the gauntlet of activities, adding the 5' uh, prime cap. Uh, and then uh, you have introns as well in the genes, and these introns need to be excised out actively uh, by a splicing uh, spliceosome, so a collection of RNA molecules and proteins that cut out these introns. At the end of eukaryotic uh, uh, transcription, you're going to add a poly A tail. So eukaryotes do the 5' prime uh, cap and the 3' prime poly A tail, prokaryotes don't. Both prokaryotes and eukaryotes can do splicing. In general, eukaryotic splicing uh, is important in protein coding uh, genes, whereas uh, in, uh, uh, in prokaryotic uh, splicing, that's mostly in non-coding RNAs. Okay. So let's get to this. This is a little bit more intense than what we've seen so far. Okay, so here's the biochemistry of adding the 5' prime cap. So sitting on that C-terminal domain of the RNA polymerase itself are a variety of enzymes. And these enzymes are adding a cap. What is a cap? Well, so remember, uh, at the 5' prime end, um, the first residue nucleotide that's added still has its triphosphate. Remember, we, we thought about that earlier in the lecture. But this triphosphate can be modified in a, another uh, guanosine, can be added upside down to this. 
So here we have a very unnatural, this is not a five prime to three prime linkage, it's a wholly unnatural five prime to five prime linkage. So here's the five prime, remember it's the methyl group and the ribose. Here's the five prime between these. We have phosphodiester bonds, phosphoanhydride bonds with our triphosphate. In addition to putting a guanosine nucleotide on upside down on this cap, we're also going to methylate. The goal here is to make this thing look different than the RNA molecule because an RNA molecule is very susceptible to enzymatic activities, exonucleases and endonucleases. But an exonuclease sees this thing and says, what the heck is that? This is, we actually need a special set of enzymes to remove this. And so this is protecting the RNA, allowing it to persist for longer in the presence of all these exonucleases and endonucleases. Okay, and so we have here um, uh, also methylation uh, at the C3 position. Remember, this is RNA, so it's not deoxy at the three prime position. We have a hydroxyl, and that can be methylated uh, there. And so the way this happens, you have the triphosphate on the five prime base. Um, you can first remove one of those phosphates, and then you can take a guanosine a triphosphate and uh, attach that, so attach a GMP, uh, to this, and so this phosphate comes from the guanosine. These two phosphates come from the N1 base, okay? And so once we've attached that, we can then use uh, methyl transferases in our old friend Atomet to methylate the C7 position on the guanosine as well as the, uh, uh, the I'm sorry, the two prime position. I, mean, I think before I said three prime, this is obviously two prime uh, hydroxyl group and that gets methylated by these second two prime O-methyl transferases, okay? So the whole goal here, make it funky looking, enhance stability. This only occurs in, occurs in eukaryotes, not prokaryotes. Uh, it's important in the processing of the RNA. So the actual nuclear pore complex is gonna be recognizing this. And when we translate eukaryotic mRNAs, the, the RNA itself is gonna be forming a circle so we're going to actually take the end of the RNA, the three prime poly A end of the RNA, and wrap that around in a circle, sort of similar in structure to a plasmid, so for it's just a single strand. And that three prime end of the RNA is going to be bound through a set of proteins to the five prime cap. Okay, and so we need these unique features to uh, be able to assemble that competent structure for translation. Okay, so that's the five prime cap. The the poly A. The addition of the poly-A tail can also be, can be considered eukaryotic uh, termination of transcription. So we have a particular sequence, uh, AAU, AAA sequence on the RNA molecule that is recognized uh, by this polyadenylation uh, factor. It binds to that. Uh, an endonuclease activity cleaves shortly after that sequence, that adenylation uh, sequence. And then a second activity within this uh, factor uh, adds uh, a bunch of adenosine residues from 200 to 500 adenosines. Okay, and so this helps also obviously to protect the three prime end of the RNA molecule because now endonucleases got to chomp or exonucleases have to chomp all the way through hundreds of residues there. Okay, makes sense so far. Cool. Okay, so now we've put the five prime cap, we put the poly A tail, uh, now we need to think about splicing. And so this gets a lot more uh, confusing. Um, and uh, so we have here exons and introns, uh, and those introns need to be removed. Um, there's different ways we can do this. One of the ways that we can remove the introns forms lassos. So this is the southwestern method. Uh, we make a lasso of the intron and we cast it out and grab some cows or something. So here we have the exons. The exons are ligated together. And you can imagine that what we're doing here is we're doing two things. We're cutting out a piece of useless um, D or RNA, um, but we're also very precisely ligating these two pieces together. We cannot make a single mistake. We cannot insert a nucleotide here, and we cannot take away a nucleotide. This has to be precise, because if we insert or remove a nucleotide, 
that would end up in changing the frame of our protein. It would totally screw up the synthesis of our protein. Okay, and so we need to do this with absolute exquisite uh, specificity. In general, each exon corresponds to a protonaceous domain that is going to be made. So there's a general relationship, and the reason is because um, the way nature figured this out, say, oh, you know, if I make a domain, that's usually associated with a certain function of protein. And so I can help other proteins to evolve by sampling and transferring domains between proteins. So if they're all sort of together as a unit, that aids in the transfer. It aids in the uh, evolving things more rapidly. Okay? It's not always the case that a particular uh, exon it is a, corresponds to a domain, but it's a very common occurrence. Okay, okay so how are we going to do this? So I put on the sideboard um, this overview slide. Um, there's actually four uh, mechanisms. Uh, so we're going to cover these in order. Uh, so group one, group two, and nuclear mRNA splicing. And so in group one and group two uh, splicing, these are catalyzed um, by RNA molecules themselves. So RNA catalyzed. Cat Catalysis, it's actually ribozymes. Okay, and so um, this is the overview, and we'll come back to this throughout uh, this section of the lecture. So let's start with group one introns. I did shuffle things around in the PowerPoints last night. Um, so here's the actual chemistry we have transesterification reactions, two of them. So here you have uh, a splice site, uh, and so uh, you have the five prime splice site. Uh, you have a phosphoester uh, bond between these two bases, a U and an A. And a solvent provided guanosine uh, comes in and, uh, and uh, makes a new phosphodiester bond. So here you have a phosphodiester bond between U and A. Here you've jettisoned the U, and you now have a GA um, phosphodiester bond. And the intron itself helps to guide in this solvent provided guanosine. So guanosine is floating around. The intron itself binds the guanosine and guides it in with exquisite specificity to exactly this position, this so called splicing site. Okay, so we've broken one bond, but now, uh, and we're obviously not going to let things go, um, we need to ligate together our two pieces. So the guanosine, remember, we're using the 3' prime hydroxyl. Here, right? So not the two prime hydroxyl. So if it's solvent provided, there's a free three prime hydroxyl. If it's coming from an RNA molecule, that three prime hydroxyl would be tied up in a phosphodiester bond. But in this mechanism, you have the three prime hydroxyl um, coming in and breaking this phosphodiester bond. We now have a, a, a three prime hydroxy group, or uh, at the five. This is the five prime splice site. This is the three prime splice site. So we now have a free hydroxyl group. Nucleophilic attack of the uh, three prime hydroxyl, the five prime splice site, upon the three prime splice site um, releases our intron. And so this hydroxyl group is going to attack the actual phosphate in the phosphodiester bond. Okay, so the phosphate is pre preserved. The guanosine is not providing a phosphate into this ligation. The phosphate was always there within the RNA molecule itself. Okay, and so this type of slicing is very primitive, uh, can be found in bacteria, lower eukaryotes, and higher plants. And this is self-splicing. This actual RNA molecule itself, the intron, is catalyzing all of this chemistry. There's not proteins. Okay. So this is the actual structure. And as you can imagine, if the RNA molecule is not just carrying information, it's catalyzing a chemical reaction, it's going to be highly complex. So here you have all kinds of base pairing, uh, and uh, the P7 uh, section is in here somewhere, and that's what actually binds to the guanosine, delivering it to the correct site. So that's group 1 introns. It's a true ribozyme, but it's not processive. Okay, so it, it catalyzes a reaction, but once that intron is cut out, it's not going to float around and cut out other introns. It's a use once type of situation. So you couldn't really call it an enzyme. Enzymes are processive, right? But it does catalyze the chemical reaction. There are examples of RNA molecules that are processive. 
um, RNASP is able to cleave um, tRNA molecules, breaking phosphodiester bonds, and obviously the ribosome itself, the thing that makes polypeptides, that is a processive RNA enzyme. Okay, in general, these ribozymes um, are very familiar with phosphodiester bonds, so they're important in either cleavage of phosphodiester bonds or some of these transesterification reactions. Okay, any questions so far? Is it unbearably boring? Should I do something crazy to wake you up? <laughs> ah! <laughs> Was that, that wasn't very convincing, huh? You don't want me to get too crazy. Okay. So, group two splicing. Now, group two splicing is a little different. Everything's in the intron. There's no solvent guanosine coming in here. An actual an adenosine from within the intron is going to be doing the nucleophilic attack in this first transesterification reaction. Okay, so the adenosine, when you think about this, this adenosine is attached through a phosphodiester linkage, you know, before and after that adenosine. So there's no 3' prime hydroxyl available for this nucleophilic attack, this first nucleophilic attack. The only thing we have is what makes this RNA molecule unique, that 2' prime hydroxy. So this 2' prime hydroxy nucleophilically attacks the 5' prime splice site, um, making a new phosphodiestergron between the 2' prime hydroxy and this um, uh, 3' prime phosphate at the 5' prime splice site. And this binding, we'll look at it in a little bit more detail in a moment, but this binding makes a lariat. So at this adenosine, we have 3' prime to 5' prime, 3' prime to 5' prime, and 2' prime to 3' prime. Okay? And so we're making this loop structure. And then we've exposed, in the process of making our so-called lariat, we've expo exposed at our 3' prime uh, uh, hydroxy group at our 5' prime splice site. And so this is going to now nucleophilically attack the phosphodiester bond at the 3' prime uh, splice site and making a new phosphodiester uh, bond, precisely ligating these two pieces together, releasing our lariat. And so if we're going to make a bond to the phosphate, obviously the end of this molecule, the 3' prime end of the lariat, is going to have just a hydroxy without the phosphate. Okay, so again, we're not, we're the phosphates that are used at this ligation are coming from within the um, gene itself, within the mRNA molecule itself. Okay, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So we have here within this intron an adenosine residue. This adenosine residue has a 2' prime hydroxyl. Nucleophilic attack of the 2' prime hydroxyl on the 5' prime splice site um, uh, makes this lariat. And so you have 2' prime um, to 5' prime uh, phosphodiester bond. That's the binding of this A to this G. Here you have uh, 3' prime to 5' prime, 3' prime to 5' prime. Okay, so this is a branch point. You have three bonds to that adenosine, so the two, typical two phosphodiester bonds. Okay, so we made our lariat. We've now exposed... 3' prime hydroxyl at the 5' prime splice site, nucleophilic attack on the phosphate within the phosphodiester bond here at the uh, so-called 3' prime uh, uh, splice site, ligates our two pieces together, releasing our lariat with a free 3' prime hydroxyl. Okay? It's a little bit, this is a little tricky. So this is also found in a similar set of organisms, bacteria, fungi, plants, and protists. Okay, so protozoa and other such uh, organisms. Okay, and so this is self-splicing in vitro. So in the total absence of proteins under the right in vitro conditions, this thing will cut itself out. But in the cell, it's more uh, believed in vivo uh, to occur with the help of proteins. But the actual catalysis itself, these transesterification reactions, are believed to be caused uh, by uh, the ribozyme portion of this. Okay. Okay. So, group two splicing is extremely similar to nuclear mRNA splicing. So, this is important in eukaryotes. And so, we have a, a set of uh, non coding RNAs, these small nuclear RNAs, that aid in this splicing. Okay. So, this is not a ribozyme necessarily. We have more. Um, these, these particular SNRNAs make so-called 
SNRNPs, SNRPs. So the blue SNRPs base pair to both the 5 prime splice plate and also eventually to the 3 prime splice plate, but also to this strategic adenosine. So within the intron, remember in the group 2 splicing, we had the bulging out, the pinching out of this adenosine. And so the U2 SNRNAs help to catalyze the increase in nucleophilicity of this adenosine by making this odd base pairing. Okay, so this is pseudouridine. Uh, it's an isomer, isomer of uridine. Uh, and so this base pairing squeezes out the adenosine. So what's the goal here? Expose the 2 prime hydroxyl on that adenosine. By squeezing it out, um, you now have a better nucleophile. And so that 2 prime hydroxyl is now going to attack um, the, uh, uh, the 3 prime uh, phosphate and the 5 prime splice slate. Okay. And so these SNRPs are helping in this process. So not only do you have SNRPs sort of bulging out that adenosine, but you also have SNRPs recognizing the sequences both on the 5 prime splice site and the 3 prime splice site. And they do this by highly selective base pairing. We don't want to insert a single nucleotide or shorten by a single nucleotide. So base pairing provides this precision of these SNRP uh, proteins. And one, thi one thing that you obviously see, so the colored segments are the regions that base pair with our SNRPs. And do you see how the majority of the sequence that base pairs are within the introns? Why did nature evolve it that way? Why is the majority of the base pairing of the SNRPs, the happy little blue SNRPs, occurring in the introns? So what are we doing here? We're making protein coding RNAs. Any ideas? Yes. Exactly. So we, we don't want to convey any unnatural restrictions on the type of amino acids that occur at the junctions between domains in a protein. So I mentioned before, each of the exons in general uh, is associated with a separate domain. So between domains in a protein, you have a linker. And if you had a large amount of sequence in the exon being re recognized in the splice sites, there would be limitations in the types of codons that are available at these uh, junctions. So the idea here is to ligate these two exons together. So there are some restrictions, but they're not major. Right? So, you know, we know it's a triplet code. We'll see that uh, on Thursday. And so potentially, these might not even make changes in the amino acids incorporated, okay? Because there's a possibility of wobble going on here. Um, and so that's why. That's why nature evolved it this way. Okay, so the SNRPs bind. They are recognizing both sides, precisely ligating to get these together. U2 SNRP is pinching out our adenosine, the 2 prime hydroxyl is now ready to go to nucleophilically attack the 5 prime splice site. Okay, and the way this happens is pretty complicated. I've actually left out, you know, tens of additional proteins. So each of these complexes, we have U1, U2, U4, U5, and U6 SNRPs. Each of those potentially could be, you know, more than one protein in, uh, in an RNA molecule. And so the way this works is there's a lot of ATP hydrolysis going on here. So it's very important that we check and double check that base pairing. If we're doing that base pairing at the 5 prime and the 3 prime splice site incorrectly, then we're going to ligate together the wrong uh, uh, nucleotides. Okay? And so here, once you bind, the binding only persists if you have good base pairing. And there's a little clock. As soon as you bind, it starts the clock, and if you bind tightly enough, if it's the right base pairing, you then hydrolyze ATP. That hydrolysis of ATP locks it in. So by adding ATP hydrolysis as a necessary step here, you're enabling the checking of the base pairing and the precise ligation. Yes? Um, it, it could be. Um, there, we don't really know for nuclear mRNA splicing. 
It's very, very similar to group 2 splicing, which is a ribozyme. It's not a processive ribozyme, like RNASP, we'll see in a moment, but it's, it's entirely possible that nuclear mRNA also, the, the catalysis, the actual transesterification itself is catalyzed by RNA molecules. Okay, and so, yes, it could be if the zyme doesn't mean processive. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so we have first the binding of U1 and U2. ATP hydrolysis, make sure that we've got the right base pairing here. Then we then assemble additional uh, SNRPs that bring these things together, helping to, in the transesterification reaction. We have the pinching out of that adenosine, and we, that is juxtaposed to the 5' prime splice site. We make the new 2' prime to 5' prime phosphodiester bond, forming the lariat, revealing the 3' prime hydroxyl at the 5' prime splice site. That 3' prime hydroxyl is then manipulated into position by um, a change in conformation and association between all these SNRPs so that you have the precise ligation of the 5' prime and the 3' prime splice site. Okay, so this is a little bit um, complicated. I think there's a movie. With Three mRNAs contain short conserved sequences required for splicing. The most conserved intron sequences are the 5' prime GU, 3' prime AG, and the branch point A. Central to the splicing reactions are five small nuclear RNAs, SNRNAs, complex with proteins in small ribonucleoprotein particles, SNRNPs. Additional proteins in ATP are also required for splicing but are not shown here. The SNRNAs base pair with pre-mRNA sequences and with each other to direct the splicing cycle. First, the 5' prime end of U1 SNRNA base pairs with the 5' prime splice site and a U2 SNRNA sequence base pairs with the branch point region. Extensive base pairing between SNRNAs and the U4 and U6 SNRNPs forms a complex that associates with U5 SNRNP. The U4, U6, U5 complex then associates with the pre-mRNA. Rearrangement of RNA, RNA base pairing occurs so that U6 dissociates from U4 and base pairs with U2. U1 dissociates from the 5' prime splice site and U5 base pairs with exon sequences. The rearranged spliceosome catalyzes two transesterification reactions, resulting in intron removal and exon ligation. Right. The ligated exons are released from the spliceosome. The SNRNPs dissociate from the excised lariat intron and are recycled for another round of splicing. The lariat intron is rapidly degraded. All right, so the, all that monkey business with things moving left and right, I'm not going to ask you to draw, okay, which one is going where. I might say, okay, well, what's the important here, U1 and U2? So U1 is the 5' prime splice site. U2 is pinching out the adenosine, so I definitely might ask you on that. And these other SNRPs are helping to bring the two, the things that need to uh, ligate together close, closer together. So this is a summary of everything. What's different, right? So uh, in the uh, group one, remember we had solvent provided three prime hydroxyl for that first uh, transesterification, whereas uh, group two in nuclear, we have the adenosine, the two prime hydroxyl adenosine. We only have the lariat um, when we're using the intron itself for the first transesterification reaction. And these two don't necessarily need proteins. This in vivo um, doesn't need proteins. This in vitro doesn't need proteins, but it could possibly need them in vivo, and this definitely needs proteins. These SNRPs are RNA molecules also associated with proteins. Okay, and so... Uh, we have the coordinate uh, uh, splicing that occurs as um, the transcript passes by our gauntlet, a poly A CTD tail. Uh, and so we have the cap synthesizing protein, puts the cap on, and then a cap binding complex, CVC, binds to the cap, keeps that cap 
stuck onto the RNA polymerase. So you're going to extrude past, but the five prime uh, uh, end is going to be s remain at the polymerase. And now as uh, uh, introns come by, we, the spliceosome also associates with the C-terminal domain of the polymerase. And as we extrude introns, um, we're going to first bind that uh, five prime splice site. Remember the adenosine, we're going to bulge it out. Uh, and then we're going to bring these two sections together. Okay, and so this is how, so it's co-transcriptional uh, processing of our RNA molecule. It's parallel processing. So this can be very complex. So here's an example of ovalbumin um, mRNA. So the little colored sections, these blue sections, are the actual protein coding segments, or the uh, exons. The introns are these large sections, and those are all ligate, or ligated out. So you think about it, the majority of uh, the RNA is cut away and degraded. What a waste, right? So there must be some evolutionary driver to, to have this, you know, pretty wasteful process. And the, the reason that this, this diversity exists is uh, because we need to do alternative splicing. We'll see that in a moment. So we splice out all our introns, and now we have our mature mRNA, some nomenclature. You have the pre-mRNA, or the primary transcript, with all uh, its introns. And then the mature mRNA is what we call the molecule once we've excised out, spliced out uh, all the introns. Okay, and so we can have alternative polyadenylation signals. So remember we have this signal, uh, AAU, AAA, and that's a signal for the endonuclease to cleave. And by some not really fully understand mechanisms, sometimes as we extrude our RNA molecule, um, the cellular machinery skips a polyadenylation site and goes to a second one. So we have alternative polyadenylation or termination giving us two different protein products, or alternative splicing. So here we, can, we have an intron. We can excise both uh, this intron uh, or the intron and an exon. And so that can give us two final products, uh, schematically represented in hashes and things like this. Okay, and so from our single primary uh, mRNA transcript, we can get multiple protein products. So in the human genome, there's on the order of tens of thousands of unique genes, but there's potentially hundreds of thousands or potentially even millions of unique proteins that can be synthesized by this uh, diversity, by alternative splicing, alternative polyadenylation. Um, Non-coding RNAs also need to be processed. This is much more simple. Um, so this is actually not transesterification. Here we're just cleaving um, bonds. So we have uh, a modification of these RNAs. So um, ribosomal RNAs are catalyzed chemical reactions. The nucleotides alone are not sufficient to provide all the chemical diversity necessary to catalyze those reactions. So we have a variety of modifications of those nucleotides. So for example, we can get uh, a methylation of the nucleotides, or you can get this uh, isomerization of the uridines, this pseudouridine size symbol. So after those modifications, we can then endonucleolytically cleave out these introns, and then we can use exonucleases to sort of trim out the remaining bits, so we're left with the mature uh, ribosomal RNA. Similar things uh, can be done in a vertebrate ribosomal RNA. That was uh, prokaryote, what we just saw. This is vertebrate. We can modify the RNA, we can methylate and so forth. We cleave into, uh, uh, we can cleave endolytically uh, and then cut off, trim the extra segments with exonucleases. Okay, and so that's the, the same type of thing. The, this uh, vertebrate uh, uh, ribosomal RNA processing is catalyzed by snow RNAs and occurs in a uh, part of the nucleus called the nucleolus. Okay, and so in the nucleolus, we have all of this processing occur. And the snow RNAs help to provide the, the sequence specificity for these cleavages. Okay? tRNAs can be processed. Here's RNAs P. It cuts off this five prime end of the tRNA. But tRNAs can also have introns. So here we have uh, an intron. And to get our mature uh, tRNA, we need to cleave out this intron. Importantly, you should see that the uh, anti-codon uh, here is in a uh, base pairing relationship here with the intron itself. So to activate the tRNA, we need to remove that intron, which will then place that anti-codon at the bulge at the bottom uh, over here. Okay, and so that's going to base pair 
uh, with their RNA and, and help to code for synthesis. This, this chemistry is highly complex. So I'll bring you through it. So you have a cyclic um, two prime to three prime phosphate. So we have an endonuclease cuts out the uh, intron and the end product of that is all screwed up, right? So you've got a two prime to three prime uh, cyclic structure here, and you have this unnatural uh, five prime hydroxyl. We're used to having a phosphate at the five prime position. So we have a kinase, uh, and the phosphate that's ligated in here comes from the ATP. It does not come from the RNA molecule. We're not ligating two pieces of RNA the, uh, with a phosphate provided by the RNA. That phosphate is coming from the kinase. Um, we can then activate this phosphate, make this O minus a better leaving group by adding an a AMP. So the AMP elated version then can react. We have a nucleophilic attack of the three prime hydroxy. So this cyclic structure opens up. We have a three prime hydroxy nucleophilic attack on this phosphate, makes our uh, new a bond, three prime to five prime bond. We're left with this unnatural two prime phosphate, and we uh, cleave that off. Okay, and so. This is more complicated. The things that you should remember is the phosphate comes from ATP, uh, and uh, it's this, this cyclic structure is formed. Okay. It's sort of the endonucleus, for whatever reason, leaves things in such a state that we need to modify it to get it back to where it needs to be. We need to put a phosphate here, activate the phosphate, and ligate the two pieces together. Okay, so we've looked now at four splicings. Um, this is for your studying, uh, and you can use this as a guide for studying. So that's it. Um, I'll see you next time.
Living in a what? In one of the flower pots. Yeah. With 11 eggs. 